Hello, you car. Peter Christensen here, coming to you from the CEO's desk. We're going to talk about the short term lease back agreement today. So, in this market, I'm hearing a lot of sellers requesting to stay in the property after the sale and buyers uh, agreeing to this. So, get the question all the time when do we need a lease? When do we need this short term lease back? agreement when do we need when when can we just mark you know 48 hours in the repsy they're all viable options the longer you go probably the more robust a document you want just because there are complications that pop up with the uh, longer span of time so if it's just a short amount of time you can use the repsy and just click possession will be 36 hours 48 hours whatever the case may be and Probably that will work for most circumstances. But this agreement, the short-term leaseback agreement, is for when the seller wants to stay for a few weeks, um, uh, uh, maybe a month. It, it says it's um, less than 60 days is what this form is designed to cover. So why would you want to use it? What do you need to know about it? Well, you'd want to use it because it will help mitigate the risk of certain events happening uh, during this period of time. And we can talk about those as we go through a few, highlight a few sections. Now, I will say this, this form is currently being worked on by the forms committee at the UAR. So we will see some updating to it in the next, I don't know, few months, maybe at the end of the summer. Not sure when the timing will be, but do look for that. We'll cover it when it happens, but I know it's being used now, so we're going to talk about why we use this. First of all, Section 2, term of the lease. So you want an end date. That's the fear as a buyer goes into this arrangement is that you are going to run into a seller who won't leave, that the term of the lease is uh, unknown. How long will the seller stay there? So we want to make sure we have that in there. Here's the end date. Really, what that gives you as a buyer is the power to evict a seller who won't leave. Then we have section three, the rent. Now, I understand sometimes rent is not paid, but what this does is a couple things. It tells you what's going to be covered. So in here, it says that the rent will include the following charges. Water, sewer, natural gas, garbage, electricity. Why? Because what we found is a lot of cities, a lot of circumstances, those, those utilities automatically transfer over to a buyer when it's recorded. And so the buyer starts getting the bills. It's really hard to then go to a seller and say, hey, I got the water and sewer bill and uh, I want you to reimburse me for it or you pay it. It's an extra step. You're ha you got to go get the money. So it's easier just to say, you know what, I'm going to anticipate how much that will cost, and I will put a lump sum in there. Uh, so that's that's the reason it ended up that way. We may see some some changes to how that functions in an update. But right now, the idea is anything that a buyer may any cost a buyer may pick up, they're saying I'm just going to include this in one lump sum. And then we have number four, a security deposit. Now, this is really important. This can be returnable, right? This is a deposit. So this can cover a couple things. Damages to the property. So buyer or sorry, seller leaves and they they leave some damages and you want to recover. Well, now you have a deposit. You don't have to go get the money from the seller. They don't cover some of the utilities they were supposed to cover. You've got protection now. Uh, maybe, yeah, and it, and it covers for maybe lost rent, stuff like that. So it's nice, even if you don't put anything in the rent section, you're letting them live there for free, I'd consider putting something in the security deposit section just so you have some coverage. Now, it incentivizes the seller to behave nicely. Seller, you get, it, you get out on time, you don't cause any damages, you cover what you're supposed to cover, then you get all this money back. No problem. But if you don't, I as a buyer have some protection where I don't have to go try to hunt this money down after the seller leaves. And the last one I want to uh, point out is the delivery section. That's in six. 
that it says the, that the seller will deliver the property in substantially the same condition as it was on the date of acceptance of the repsy. So when you went under contract, so basically it delineates who's responsible for what. If the seller, if something goes wrong that's not normal wear and tear, seller still has to put it in the same condition it was in, the property in the same condition it was in by the time they, uh, when, when it was under contract when they leave. So if it's 60 days later, a couple months, a lot can happen. You got the transaction time, you got the lease back time. A lot can happen in that span of time and the seller's responsible for non wear and tear damages. So those protections are put in there. That's why you use this. If you just check, you know, seller can stay there for two weeks for 14 days in the repsy. Well, you're opening yourself up to problems that are harder to solve without this agreement. If you're gonna go for a longer term, I'd suggest maybe doing a full-blown lease agreement because it covers even more than the short-term lease covers. So the longer the, the time span, the more problems can occur, the more issues you need to deal with, and the more you should consider a robust, a more robust um, document. I said more a lot in that sentence. So uh, just remember, this is not specific legal advice. This is legal information only. If you need specific legal advice, please contact your attorney. Thanks for tuning in.